morning. Welcome again to Simple Faith Calvary Chapel. If you open your Bibles this morning with me to Ephesians chapter 3, as we continue our wonderful study through the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to continue looking at this second prayer of the Apostle Paul. Let's start in verse 14, and we'll read through verse 19, and then we'll pray. Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes all, or excuse me, passage knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Let's pray. Lord, as we come once again, to study your word, Father, may you touch us, may you anoint us afresh with your Holy Spirit, Lord. May our minds, Lord, be enlightened by your Holy Spirit as you promised to do to help us to understand those things that are of your Holy Spirit, Lord. We lift ourselves up to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Now, last week we started this wonderful prayer of the Apostle Paul's. And, and again, what a blessing to be able to come, to read, to study, to understand, to help to grow in our own prayer lives. You know, a lot of times we go out and, and buy these books on prayer, and there's some wonderful books on prayer. R.A. Torrey, E.M. Bounds, other great men and women who have written wonderful works on prayer. But what a blessing to just come to the prayers of the Bible, to see how we are encouraged and how we can learn how to pray and grow in our own prayer lives. And in verse 16, we see that Paul here uh, prays first that God would, you know, grant them to be strengthened with might through his Holy Spirit in the inner man according to the riches of of his grace and we looked at that last week and he prayed in verse 17 that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and we looked at that and now Paul continues in verse 17 that you being rooted and grounded in love and that's where we're coming to this morning we're gonna just look at that last part of verse 17 that you being rooted and grounded in love because you see, we, we kind of see that each thing is predicated by the other, by the previous. We see here in verse 18 that it's predicated by verse 17, which is predicated by verse 16. Now look at verse 17 again. And in the Amplified Version, it says this, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you may be rooted deep in love and founded securely on love, that... You may have the power to be strong and apprehend and grasp with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. So it all starts with Christ dwelling within our hearts. I, there, I have a book at home, it's called Christ Indwelling and Enthroned. Uh, that's, I think that's by E.M. Bounds, and just a sweet book on Christ indwelling us, but also being on the thrones of our hearts. And as Christians, we need to first start and foremost, as Christ is dwelling in our hearts, as we were told here, through faith. That we have faith in the Word of God. That we have faith in Jesus Christ. You know, today we are being mocked more and more for our faith. But beloved in Christ, we need to be those who are being more and more rooted and grounded in our faith in Jesus Christ and in the love of Jesus Christ. So we can then have power to be strong enough to go on to apprehend and grasp with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height of the love of Christ which surpasses all understanding. Can I have an amen? 
Amen. What glorious words we've come to. And again, every word you come to in God's word is glorious. And uh, you just see how, you know, it all ties together. Again, we must have Christ indwelling within our hearts through faith so that we can then be rooted and grounded in his love. To be rooted, to be grounded in the love of Christ. You know, it's interesting, we're told in the New Testament to test yourselves to see whether you be in the faith or not. And, and I don't know about you, but I've never been a big guy for tests. I've never really liked tests. I don't, li I don't mind studying, to be honest with you, but I've never liked tests. And maybe because I was Catholic and I went to Catholic schools and the nuns would come by and they'd hit you with the rulers. We had those, I call them the Nazi nuns. And the first set of nuns I had, they would, man, yeah. But the point is, is we're told to test ourselves to see whether we be in the phase. And a lot of times we don't like to take that test. We like to just muddle on through our lives. We like to continue on how we are because it's all good, you know. It's all fine, you know. I don't need to change. Everything's fine. But we need sometimes to take a step back and gaze into the depth of our souls with the help of God through his word, by his spirit, to look and see where our foundations lie. What are we rooted? What are we grounded in? What are our lives, our thoughts, our minds, our beliefs? What are they grounded in? What's, what's the grounding force? What is the foundation of them? Is it the love of Christ or is it in something else? We are to be rooted and grounded in love. In the love of Jesus Christ. And here we see that the disciple of Christ, the saint of the Lord, the born again child of God is to be rooted and grounded in love. Man, I just love the word pictures throughout the Bible, but especially throughout the New Testament. Man, it, this is just radical stuff. Here we have, you know, we're to be rooted and grounded. The word rooted there in the Greek is rizu, and it literally means this, a root, or to become stable, to strengthen with roots to render firm, to fix, to establish, to cause a person or a thing to be thoroughly grounded. The only other time this Greek word appears in the New Testament is in the book of Colossians. Please turn with me there to Colossians chapter 2. Just a few couple books over to your right. Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 6. You see the same word, Greek word here, rizu, used. Rooted. Colossians 2, verse 6, it says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Verse 7, rooted and built up in him. Now that word rooted is the same Greek word. Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. So, beloved in Christ, we see here, that as we walk in Christ Jesus, if we have received him, we are to be rooted and built up and established in the faith. Notice, as you have been taught, it is as we grow in the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we grow in the obedience to our Lord Jesus Christ, that we grow, that we are established. And we see here in this scripture that it's actually our choice to be rooted or not in the Lord Jesus Christ, to be rooted in him with abounding therein with thanksgiving. So, first of all, we see that we need to be rooted in love. Now, if you come back to our text, it also said, then it says grounded, rooted and grounded in love. So, the, the word for Greek there, in, uh, for grounded there, is themaliu, and it literally means this, to be grounded, to lay a basis for, a foundation ground, settled, to make stable, to establish, foundational, to found, to lay the foundation of anything. It's interesting, it's the same Greek word, you don't have to turn there, that we find in Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus is talking about the one who hears his sayings of mine and does them, would be like the wise man. He goes on there to say, 
that the rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat the house, and it did not fell, fall, for it was founded on the rock. The word founded there is the same word that we have here within our text this morning, to be grounded, to be founded firmly upon. And this is who we are to be as Christians, to be rooted, to be grounded firmly in the love of Jesus Christ. It's the same word used in Hebrews chapter 10, it says, or Hebrews 1, excuse me, verse 10, and you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. It laid the foundation, the same Greek word word we need to have a firm foundation a firm rooting in love to be christians to be followers of jesus christ so again what are we to be rooted in what are we to be grounded in we're to be grounded in love can anybody here guess what that word love is in the greek agape agape man what a wonderful word study to do for you by the way it's one of those words, if you look at it, it's not actually used too much in the first three Gospels or in the book of Acts. It's, it's more it was a word of love that was almost hijacked by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul, through the Apostle John as they came. And it, it, agape means love, affection, benevolence, charity, uh, to love. Zodiades, a Greek scholar, says this about this word agape. He said, it is a love that seeks what is best for the other, not necessarily what they want, but what they need. An example of this is found, he said, in John 3, 16, for God so loved, agape the world, that he gave his only begotten son. He goes on to say, now God's love for the world led him to give the world a gift. It was not a gift wanted by mankind. But God knew what man needed, i.e., his son, to bring forgiveness to man. This is what we're to be grounded, to be rooted in as Christians. Agape love. You see, as Christians, as disciples, as born-again children of God, we are to be those who were rooted and grounded in love. Turn with me, please, to John chapter 13. John chapter 13 is Jesus commands this sort of love. John chapter 13, starting in verse 34. A phrase, for, a passage familiar to all of us. John 13, 34, it says, A new commandment, this is Jesus speaking, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this will all know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. To be rooted, to be grounded in the love of Jesus Christ. You see, I'm reminded as we live here in the Pacific Northwest, anybody have any pine trees around their house? Anybody see any pine trees? You know, the pine tree, it's, you know, I love pine trees. They're majestic, they're beautiful, they're how tall they grow, how lovely they are, and how strong they look. Just majestic and inspiring. Yet, with all the rain that we get here in the Pacific Northwest, did you know that their roots never actually go very deep? They actually average about one foot deep. One foot deep. Think about how tall you see those. Sometimes they may go down to two or two to three feet. There's been some found. But again, they don't go too deep because there's no need to for them that they think. They, would, they rather actually go out. They'll go out 20 or 30 feet and not very deep. That's what they do. And they stay close to the surface. They gather the water, the nutrients they need. One source said this about pine tree roots. Pine tree roots can extend as far as two or three times the width of the drip line or far, the farthest point from the tree where the foliage grows. Pine trees are not known for having invasive root systems, but if the soil is dry, the roots will go where the water is. Most roots, roots within the top, or, or grow within the top foot of the surface. 
beautiful tree. But what happens with shallow roots? Anybody here ever have a tree fall on their house in the Pacific Northwest? Hey, you don't have to live up here very long. I, we've lived up here 15, 16 years, and I remember talking to a friend of mine, Lacey, uh, we used to work with, and, and she, when she was younger, she had, they had a, tr a pine tree fall on her house. She was trapped in her house, and she's always been afraid of that. Now, when they moved to a new house, they had to make sure all the pine trees were cleared away from her house. You see, because when the winds come, when the storms blow, the pine tree, because it doesn't have deep roots, it falls over. But then you see the burly and regal oak tree. Now, the oak tree is much different wherever you go, but even here in the Pacific Northwest. Another writer said this about their roots. A young seedling oak tree have what's called tap roots. Unlike the fibrous roots that grow in the shallow soil around the base of a plant, tap roots grow deep into the soil and originate directly beneath the tree's trunk. The oak tree's uh, roots go can go down to as much as 20 feet deep. 20 feet straight down. And so we see here that when the winds come and the storms blow, it's very rare you'll see an oak tree that has fallen over. Both beautiful trees, but when the storms come, when the trials come, if you will, it depends on how deeply a tree is rooted if they're going to fall over or stand. What a beautiful and glorious example of a Christian that as the storms come into our lives, how deeply... Are we rooted? How firmly are we grounded in love? You know, it's interesting. This is a picture, again, of, of being rooted and grounded. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. We mentioned this a few minutes ago. But now we're going to turn there, please. Matthew chapter 7. This is Jesus is concluding the Sermon on the Mount, what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 7. Starting in verse 24. Matthew 7, verse 24. Jesus speaking again. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded. Okay? Grounded, the same word we have in our text this morning. It was founded on the rock. Look at verse 26, though. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rains descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was that fall. You see, beloved in Christ, there are many people who will claim to walk with Christ for a long time. And they hear the word of God, they even may even be reading the word of God, but they are not obeying the word of God. And thus they are not founding their lives. They are not living in accordance to the word of God. And great that fall shall be. Maybe you've fallen here today. Maybe this is you. Maybe this explains you. I'll tell you what, it explained me for a portion of my life as a Christian. Because I was taught you don't need to. You can't read the Bible really on your own. I was taught don't read the Bible. And then when I, so I finally started doing that, because I would fall all the time into sin and these different things, I would sin with the leaders in the church. Hey, let's sit down and get drunk together. But once I started reading the Word of God, I found liberation. I found strength. I found commands to obey and a Holy Spirit there to help me, to empower me to do so. And to found my life now upon the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Turn with me please too to see some more word pictures to Psalm 1. Psalm 1. Love this picture. If you ever receive a card from me or something, assign something, I usually put this, I just write Psalm 1. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law 
of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree. Notice here again, what is he like? He's like a tree that is planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither. Whatever he does shall prosper. But the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous but the way of the ungodly shall perish. To be rooted, to be founded, to be grounded in the love of Jesus Christ. You know, again, it's not a coincidence that we're to be rooted and grounded in love. Turn with me again to Matthew chapter 13. Man, just such beautiful pictures that all so brilliantly and just supernaturally tie together. Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 1. So again, it's no coincidence that we, that we are to be rooted and grounded in love. It, it all, again, ties together as we come to the parable of the sower and the seeds, and we see that it depends on the hardness or the softness of our hearts that allows the seeds of God's love to grow or not to grow in our lives. Look at verse one there. It says, On the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some of the seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no roots, they withered away. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear." Now, what we're so blessed as, the disciples basically said, Jesus, what, why are you talking in parables? What's going on? We, we don't understand what you're saying. That was me, amen? So this comes, if we hop up to verse 18, we see Jesus now explaining it. Look at the beautiful. Verse 18. And remember our text this morning. See how it all ties together. Verse 18. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. Whenever anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received the so seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed in, on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has, check it out, no roots in himself, but it endures only for a while for when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word immediately he stumbles now he who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke out the word and he becomes what is it unfruitful Verse 23, but he who receives the seed on the good ground is he who hears the word of God and understands it and in, who indeed bears fruit and produces some 100, some 60, some 30. Do you see how it's all tying together? How we're to be rooted and grounded in the love of Jesus Christ? Turn with me please to John chapter 15. One more. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. John chapter 15, starting in verse 1. We come to Jesus again. John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruits. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. 
As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Can I have an amen? Amen. amen. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. To bear fruit, to have deep uh, roots and, and to be firmly planted in the love of Christ, in Christ himself abiding in Jesus Christ. And then the result of, of this, as we have deep roots, as we're grounded in the love of Christ, as we abide in Christ, is that we're going to bear fruit. Can I have an amen? amen. We're going to bear much fruit. And so prove, another translation says, to be the disciples of Jesus Christ. Of, and again, I love this. And, and the seed of Christ we see through his word. And, you know, when Paul, I love this because it goes on to say, well, well, what is the fruit that we will see in our lives as we abide in Christ, as we're firmly rooted in plant, and, and planted in love? What are, what's going to be the fruit in our lives? Turn to Galatians chapter 5. We don't have to guess. Most of you already know. You're, you're going right where I'm th thinking. Galatians chapter 5. Let's start in verse 16, though. Galatians 5, starting in verse 16. So again, as we're rooted and grounded in love, as we're abiding in Christ, what's going to be the fruit of that? How can we tell? How, what's going to be the outcome of that? Galatians 5, 16 says, But I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other. Did you hear that, beloved in Christ? Our flesh and our spirit are opposed to each other. To keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But, verse 22, but the fruits of the Spirit is love. Do you see that? The first fruit of the Spirit, and some uh, Bible commentators actually teach that that is the fruit of the Spirit is love, and then it goes on to describe love, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. So first and foremost, it is love. As we are rooted and grounded in love, the fruit in our lives will be love. It will be joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Can I have an amen? amen? Hey, too many churches today, too many who claim Christ are saying, hey, just bring your sins into the church. Continue to practice them. Get better at them. Matter of fact, me as a pastor, I'm going to practice them too. That's disgraceful and disgusting. But then again, what sins don't do we wink at in our lives? You know, we, we read before, hey, well, you know, I'm, I'm just a guy. I have outbursts of wrath. You know, it just happens. Or I'm a, a gal. That's how I am. It's just part of who I am. Of course it's part of who you are. It's your flesh that we're told here you need to go and crucify. Not codify, not coddle it. Oh, it's okay. It's just part of who I am. No, it needs to be part of who you are that goes on the cross. Forget that, man. We need to be those who have the, the fruit of the Spirit growing and thriving in our lives because we are rooted and grounded in love. 
Now here's a great question for all of us here this morning. What fruit is being produced in your lives, in my life? Hey, this can be a scary question, amen? And this is how you find out. You don't go to the person. If you want to find out about Pastor Bill, hey, what fruits does Bill have in his life? Who are you going to go ask? His wife first, right? Now, even his wives, it can be, well, you know, what about the children? In other words, look, man, it's always best to go to those around us to find out, hey, what fruit is being produced in my life? So if we spoke, let's say, to the kids out here, if we spoke to your moms and dads, and we said, hey, do they have the fruit uh, of, of love growing in their life, what would they say? Better yet, let's ask your brother or sister. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Do your brothers and your sisters, do, or do they feel loved by you, the love of Christ, even as you're young and you're dying to self? Hey, what if married people, again, what if we did ask your spouse, and they were honest? Would they say that you have, you know, the fruit of love in your life, much love, much fruit? That you have joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control growing in your lives? Well, they show me love sometimes. I see it every once in a while. Oh, beloved in Christ. Are you and I bearing, and again, much fruit. It's not just a little much fruit, Jesus said. You see, the cool part about a fruit tree, anybody here have fruit trees on their property? Raise your hand. Do you ever see a fruit tree eating its own fruit? Never. We, we have, you know... Some apple trees, pear trees, you know, white plum trees, and there's, they never just are picking themselves, but I taste pretty good. But you see, that's how we judge ourselves as Christians, amen? I'm doing pretty good. I like to look in them. I'm doing pretty good. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a great Christian, you know, I'm just a wonderful Christian. And in reality, people might be taking the fruit, oh, that's kind of bitter. You see, because it, the fruit is for others to enjoy around us and be blessed by Man, I, when, when, when I mow the yard and, 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 and during the middle of the summer and our, tr our plum tree's out kind of on the far end, it's a, a white plum tree. We have a couple acres and, and I'll be sitting in it and when it's really hot, you know, and you go out there and there's nothing like plucking one of those plums off of there and, and just taking this big juicy bite. Just sweet as can be. But you know what's gnarly is when you take that bite and it's like all sour and gross. You see, it has the look of a sweet tree. It even has fruit growing, but then you take a bite. Is that how we are today? Do we have the look of a good Christian? Do we have the look of fruits? But when somebody comes close, do they see? Do they hear? Do they feel? Or do they feel love, joy, peace, patience from us? Hey, if this is you this morning, if you have the bitterness, if you have these things, it's like, well, you know, this is just going to how it's going to be. No, that's not how it's supposed to be. Repent, beloved. Bear good fruit in keeping. Jesus said, in keeping with repentance, bear good fruit in keeping with repentance. See, as Christians, as we are rooted and grounded in love, keep our hearts grounded in the love. That means to do that, we need to keep our hearts fallowed up, broken up, fallow ground. One of the, the first things you have to do when you, if you have a garden and it's, you know, coming, and prayerfully you didn't plant your garden a little too early this year before the freeze, you know, came once again. We've been praying, actually, for some of the farmers in the area because I know that this is a scary thing for some of them, the freeze and the snow that we've had. But one of the first things that we have to do is we go out and you, you get a rototiller and you till up the ground. You make it soft. You get rid of any weeds. And beloved, we need to have hearts that are continually softened, broken up by the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, where we allow it to happen. And we allow the trials in our lives not to harden us. Well, I'm going to get tough, man. I'm going to toughen up, bro. I'm going to be tough. No, we allow it to break our hearts. We allow it to break us. And we come and we humble ourselves before God. And the Bible says he will lift us up. Too many times we want to lift ourselves up. 
We're to be rooted and grounded, keep our hearts soft and tender towards the Lord, towards his word, towards repentance, towards sin. Not just accept it, not just coddle it, but to repent of it, to mourn over it, to grieve, to weep. When's the last time we cried over our own sin? Perhaps some of us here need our roots dug up. Hey, thrown into the fire. Come before God, he will do it. Come before the Lord, confess your sins. He will forgive you of those sins. He will change you. He will fill you afresh. Come in faith in his word. Believe what you read here. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. Are you rooted and grounded in love? Now, a lot of us just answer that right away and say, yes, I am. I'm rooted and grounded in love. I'm not perfect, but I'm rooted and grounded in love. And yet, excuse me, I'm still fighting a little cold here. And yet, when we see that, there's no real fruit in our lives. We have fruitless cherry trees on our property. I, I'm like, they're worthless. You know, my mind, just tear them out. If they're not going to bear fruit, dude, I don't want them. And, and you see, beloved in Christ, there are a lot of us who say, oh, yes, I'm rooted and grounded in love, but we don't have any proof in keeping with this. You see, Jesus himself said in John 14, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. In other words, we need not guess if we love Jesus or not. We need not even falsely proclaim that we love Jesus or not. You see, the true loving heart, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. What's the old saying, the old adage? The proof is in the pudding. The proof will be that if we are in the bearing fruit and love, the love of Jesus, and, and Jesus tells us what love is to him, what our part of biblical love is. You see, a lot of us have misunderstood this. They'll say, hey, Pastor Bill, you talk a lot about obedience, this loving obedience to Jesus. Why do you talk about it so much? You know why? Because the Bible does. God's word does. But I also do this because there are many out there, and even perhaps some in here, that claim to love Jesus and yet are not obeying him and his word. I remember driving with someone years ago, driving down the freeway. And this fellow was just living in total rebellion to God, not going to church, not reading his Bible, not walking with the Lord, not bringing his children up in the ways and admonitions of the Lord, not loving his wife as Christ led the church. And as we're driving down, he's like, yeah, I really love Jesus. And he believed what he was saying. I really love Jesus. And I just looked at him and I said, no, you don't. And he's like, yes, I do. I love Jesus. No, you don't. He said, how can you say that? How can you judge me? And because Jesus himself said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. We don't have to guess what loving Jesus looks like, guys and gals. Too many of us do. Well, I love Jesus, and I'm just going to go live how I want to live. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. It doesn't matter because it, God loves me, and it's all. I can just go do whatever I want. You know what? You can go do whatever you want because you're really loving yourself. You're doing still what you think is best for you instead of knowing what God knows is best for you. Amen. Jesus said, if you love me. So again, love isn't some gooey, gooey, I love you, Jesus. You're my boyfriend, Jesus. You're my girlfriend. I mean, seriously, we almost come, you come to some of the praise songs. I love you like I love my, you know, like a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And it's like this, instead of, dude, you are holy, you are glorious, you are awesome, you are my God, you are my Savior. And a lot of us walk, well, you know, well, I just, I love Jesus, but no, that's too binding, that's too legalistic. I'm not going to obey his word. Well, Jesus himself says, then you don't love me. Your argument, again, it's not with Pastor Bill. It's not with anybody else. It's with Jesus in his word. Jesus in his word. You see, they truly have no clue what biblical love is on our part as disciples of Christ. Do you get that? 
There's God's part, and then there's our part as disciples, as born-again believers in Jesus Christ, as his children. It is a response to the love of God. I love you, and I will obey you because I love you. Because you know what? I'm a bonehead. Can I have an amen to anybody else who's a bonehead here? I'm a bonehead. I'm a sinner. I'm a scumbag. I don't care about saying that stuff. Because my Jesus is greater than all my scumbaggedness. And he has saved me from my sin. You see, when I do things my way, it always leads to sin. When I do things God's way in accordance to his word, it always leads to life. And that's what Jesus said. Beloved, we are not free as Christians to come up with our own definition of love. To be rooted and grounded in love means to be rooted and grounded in the love explained in the word of God. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. You see, we are not free as Christians, I'm going to say this again, to come up with our own definition of love. However heartfelt that may de definition may be, it is also heartfeltly, I don't know if that's a word, wrong. God himself gives us our sight of his definition of love quite clearly in his word. In other words, God tells us in his word clearly what our love is to look like as Christians. You see, I'm not, a, I'm not allowed to say I'm a Christian and then go home and be a jerk to my wife. I'm not allowed to say I'm a Christian and then go flip people off on the, when I'm driving around or curse at them. I'm not free to do that. And if you think you're free to do that, you are very wrong. I'm free to go and cuss. You're not free to go and cuss. I'm free to go and get drunk. You're not free to go and get drunk. Praise God, I don't have to do those things anymore. See, to the one who's saved, it's freedom. To the one who is not saved, it's bondage. So if you're hearing this this morning, oh man, this is bondage, this is legalism, I don't think you're saved. I'm just going to say it. You know, I'm reading in Ezekiel, and I just read in Ezekiel, I think it's 33. I'm responsible as a pastor, as a preacher, as a shepherd, to tell you what God's word says. And if I don't, the, your blood, if you end up going to hell, is on my, it's on me. But if I tell you the truth of what God tells us, it's on you. You see, if God's words are burdensome to us, if his commands are a bummer, then there's something wrong with your professed faith in Jesus Christ. And we need to understand that. Our professed love. To be rooted and grounded in love is to be one who is rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ. Rooted and grounded. Jesus goes on to say in John 14, Whoever has my commands and keeps them is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. That's pretty legalistic, Jesus. Amen? Come on, everybody. Amen? He goes on in verse 23. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and he will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Thus, beloved in Christ, we need to understand to be rooted and grounded in love includes being obedient to Jesus Christ through his word. And it's not a burden. It's a joy. It is freedom to the Christian. It is life. This book is not a bummer to the Christian. This book is life. And if we are not doing as God's commanded us through his word, if we are doing, and if we are doing the things God says not to do in his word, then don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself. You're not a Christian. We're not Christians. And, and, and here's the thing, though. What's radical and what's joyous and what's full of God's grace is you are here hearing this. Maybe you're at home hearing this. Repent today. Amen. Repent. You can still hear, right? Everybody here can hear me? Some for better, some for worse. Amen. He's still going. Wake me up when he's done, honey. <laughs> Look. 
Hear the voice of God today. Repent. It's that easy. Come to find forgiveness. Find new life in Jesus Christ. Let yourself fall in love with him who loves you. The grace of God. You know, I was reading a post the other day. And it was about, there's some town somewhere that wanted to have a, some people wanted to have a homosexual parade. And the city said, no, you can't have it. And this was on a Christian news thing. And so people were committing or commenting. And some guy comments and says, like, yeah, that's good. Keep them scumbag weirdos away, you know. Well, you all know me. If you don't, you'll find out. I had to say something to the guy. Now you need to repent, brother. If you claim Christ, you need to repent. I think with the way we talk about any sinner. They're lost. They need Jesus Christ. They need to repent and be born again of the Spirit of God. I don't care what sin it is. You know, beloved in Christ, we need to be those who are responding, who are walking in the love of Jesus Christ. You know, we have within our culture some very disturbing things taking place. You know, when somebody can walk in that's 19 years old and just start shooting it at other kids, you know, and, and just start taking lives. And, and again, it's a phenomenon that's really been take, that, taking place the last 20 plus years. Do you know what I believe it is? I believe it's a lack of love. Why do I say that? Because in Romans we read that love is a fulfillment of the law. In other words, he says, he goes on to explain, look, if we love God, we're not going to take his name in vain. If we love God, we're not going to have any other gods before. He goes on to say, if we love our neighbors, we're not going to, we don't even need to hear, don't covet their stuff, don't steal from them, don't murder them. Amen? But it's a lack of love. That, that kid went in there. He didn't love anybody there. He was filled with hatred. And you see, that's what we have. We have a culture, sadly, that has become a culture of hatred. Because sadly, a lot of your, what we would call the leftist elitists, a lot of them, by the way, like us fighting amongst ourselves. They, they like to pit this race against that race, the poor against the rich, this against that, because they love to see us fighting because Jesus said a nation divided against itself cannot stand. But you see, we also see something I believe that the Bible said would happen. That the, the natural love of many would grow cold. And we see that happening within our society, and not just within America, but all over the world. It's, it's part of what we see in the end times. And beloved in Christ, we need to be those who understand, who see what is going on, and take extra steps that maybe they didn't have to take 20 years ago, 100 years ago, to remain and abide in the love of Christ, to be rooted and grounded in the love of Jesus Christ. So that when someone comes at us and they're mean or they're, they're, they're attacking us, we respond with love and with blessings. Because we've been with Christ. When your husband says something mean to you, your wife says something vitriolic to you, you respond, I love you, I'm going to pray for you. And we go and weep because we let it break us and not harden us. You see the difference? See, when we harden ourselves, we think, oh, I'm just going to be tough. That God, that's when we won't even let God come and minister to us. We need to be those who are walking in the love of Christ, responding in the love of Christ, because we are rooted, we are grounded in the love of Jesus Christ. Can I have an amen? amen. That when we see the homeless, when we hear of people in prison or people who are sick, we go and take care of them. We don't run the other way. Love goes to. Self-preservation, self-love runs away. Amen? How many people here need to change in their lives? Raise your hand if you don't mind. I'm raising mine highest, higher than anybody here. Almost Dave's almost higher. Can I ask you to raise again if you need that change? Whoever needs that change? Man, I'm looking around. I want everybody, please raise your hand. If, if, if it's from your heart, okay, you can put your hands down. I know some of you are raising them because you don't want to look stupid in front of others. But I'm telling you what. 
Today is the day, if you hear the voice of God, if you hear through his word, today is the day to change. Today is the day to be that Christian that God is calling you to be, to be rooted and grounded in the love of Christ and to be bearing the fruits in our lives. Can I have an amen? amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I lift up myself, I lift up everyone here, those watching on the internet, Lord, and we lift up Christians around this country and the world. So many of us, Lord, have settled for a Christianity that cares mostly nothing about just ourselves, Lord, and loving ourselves and being ourself instead of taking that old self and crucifying it, Father. Oh, Lord. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. But also thank you for your correction, Lord. You discipline those whom you love. You correct us, Lord. Oh, Father, thank you that we can abide in you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that we can walk in you, Lord. May we be those who is in Psalm 1, Lord, who are like those trees, a tree for a family firmly planted, by rivers of life, Lord, in you, Lord Jesus. May we go deeper, Lord. May we sacrifice more to love you with all we are and to love others, Lord, as we love ourselves, Lord. We lift up our country, Lord Jesus, to you. And we do pray for your mercy, Lord but also for changed hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.